in meditation we should have a hyper awareness super awareness but with a calm relaxed body stress is more fattening than chocolate fasting creates autophagy which means it's going to clean up those dead cells and zombie cells that are in the system in india in the vedas they say eat three times a day be sick eat two times a day be well eat one time a day be excellent they've actually shown in studies if you get poor sleep three days in a row it's as if you were drinking if you're sitting for more than three hours You've now lost 10% of the oxygen in your brain. Your body needs that deep cycle sleep to reset your circadian rhythm, but also to build up your neurotransmitter bank account. Brain researcher, meditation leader, best-selling author, founder and inventor of Brain Tap Tech. Our guest today on The Settle or be better podcast is Dr. Patrick Potter, who's going to be talking to us about brain fitness and a lot more. So welcome Dr. Patrick and over to you. Why don't you begin by telling us a little bit about your current work and what exactly is brain tap tech? Yeah, well, my work since the eighties actually is to better the human condition by bettering people's brains, by helping them to use their brain. Now, back in the 70s and 80s, we didn't know that it was doing such good stuff when you do meditation, but now we know through neuroscience what's going on and why it's so important to start this as your everyday practice. So um, what we're doing is we're going around our country and actually the world. I just got back from London as well, where we're, we're measuring people pre and post to show them scientifically what's going on when they use the brain tap and it's at times even showing them what, what is happening if they're doing their own practice to show them that there are, there are some practices we found that were very beneficial and some that don't, might not work for you. Lovely. That's really amazing to know. And definitely our, our uh, listeners can reach out to you and learn more about Brain Tap Tech. There will be links in the description below. So definitely go and learn more for yourself and probably get a chance to experience it yourself. And we're really grateful to have you here today. Uh, and jumping right into your topic today, my first question to you is that, you know, as a brain researcher, what do you observe are some of the most common mistakes we make on a daily basis that is affecting our brain in a bad way? And we probably don't even know about it. Well, first of all, if you're using an alarm clock to wake up in the morning and you're using the blaring sound of the alarm clock, that's probably one of the worst things you can do for your nervous system. So I recommend picking out one of your favorite um, relaxing uh, songs. In fact, uh, I actually wake up to the Gayatri Mantra because I want to listen to it three times. Okay. I want to chant it three times when I wake up. So if I do use an alarm, that's set. That's what's set. Most of the time, I don't need an alarm. Uh, but if I'm traveling and I'm only going to sleep, you know, a short amount of time that I do that. The other the other thing I think people do is at two o'clock in the afternoon, your temperature drops no matter where you're at in the world. Most people will go get tea or chocolate or coffee. Uh, what you really want to do there is do a some breath work, maybe even a brain tap session or meditation because your body recycles at that time. And then it does the same thing at night at sleep, but it but it increases temperature. At night, I think one of the worst things that people do is they watch TV right up to the time they go to sleep. And this is bad because whatever we last put into our consciousness is what we dream about. So that's mm -hmm. why it's super important to do some kind of uh, meditation right before sleep so that you're bringing in that higher level thinking while you're dreaming. Wow, these were some amazing insights and I'm sure that these are some really easy actionables that our listeners can start doing from today and a lot of us have been doing this unconsciously, especially the alarm clock thing and, you know, watching TV or watching some sort of content before sleeping. That's like become almost, uh, it's almost on autopilot now, right? Like, so that's something that we can definitely get rid of immediately. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and talking about brain fitness, what exactly is brain fitness? Are we following something from that concept already? And what are some things that we can start doing to sort of work with it? Yeah. Well, first of all, your your brain is either evolving and creating neuroplasticity for a positive thing for you, or it's evolving and creating negative neuroplasticity. One is called neuro. One is actually called neuro pruning, which means it's starting to disconnect, and and that leads to dementia and Alzheimer's. So using and challenging the brain is so important. So we always recommend number one that you eat a good diet. You know, make sure you can't outthink a bad diet. That's number one. Number two, you have to move and breathe. So things like yoga and Tai Chi and dance, 
These are all things we need to do regardless of our meditative practice. And then we need some kind of meditation practice in the form of breath work maybe. Uh, we just actually, uh, myself and Dr. Varun were voted uh, researchers of the year in India because we, we proved out that pranayama yoga, uh, the breathing techniques, uh, breath work actually balances out the frontal lobe and can can put uh, dementia at, at put it aside. Yeah. So th the main thing is now we use light, sound, and vibration. So uh, you know, and I remember first meeting Dr. Varun at at Ames Bhopal, and he thought that I was teaching people to cheat with meditation. It was funny, yeah. and I said, "Well, have you ever meditated to a candle?" And he said, "Yes." And I said, "Dr. Varun, you're cheating." He said, "What do you mean?" I said, "There's mirror neurons. Our brain." actually is always syncing with its environment. It has a evoked potential of 0 0.5 to 100. So if we're looking at a candle, for instance, that candle flickers at 10 hertz frequency. It happens to be alpha. That's where you wanna go when you meditate. So you can do yeah. the same thing with singing bowls or chanting. These are all things that cause the brain to synchronize and go into this set. Now we want you to go to theta, which is a deeper state. So I asked him, I said, have you ever went to the Himalayas and meditated? He said, yes. I said, Dr. Varun, you're cheating. He said, what do you mean? I said, when you sit in the, when you sit in the Himalayas, the Himalayas resonate at 7.8 Hertz frequency. Every mountain does. So when you're in that mountain, it's an isochronic tone, meaning it's, it's resonating a frequency that puts you into a state of deep theta. Now, theta produces a neurotransmitter called GABA. GABA is a precursor to something called DMT. DMT is what happens in our brain when we have a spiritual experience, and it's, it's in every cell of our body right now. But when it's in a, a, a certain amount of activity in the brain, when we release that neurotransmitter, we start to see and have those spiritual experiences. It's like the chemical that we need in our brain so that we can see this other dimension that's all around us all the time, but because we're so stressed out in our amygdala, that part of the brain that is hijacked from fear, stress, and frustration, that part, when that part's dysregulated, we don't get to see or be a part of this kind of world that's right here coexisting with us. So the biggest thing we can do is start a practice, and there's three times during the day, and I, I think everyone kind of gets it because I already said it. First thing in the morning, we need to do a SMR practice, which means sensory motor rhythm. It's a fast breathing like what uh, Yogi Bhajan and Kundalini Yoga would call breath of fire, you know, mm -hmm. this rapid breath. And then what we do is we practice that, and then we do a 10-minute brain tap session. Because now we've woke up the brain, we've, called, we've caused the brain to create neuropronephrine, dopamine, and cortisol, which we need in the morning to get up and do our thing. And then uh, once we do our meditation, we can do some kind of physical fitness to keep our body in shape. Or we do it before. If you're if you, uh, stretching in yoga or tai chi, those are all things. I would do those first and then do your meditation because then you get more neuroplasticity. And then in the afternoon, when I said those, those downtimes, if you can do, like in our case, we've shown that you can actually reclaim the energy that you had in the morning and even more if you do this in the afternoon. So you can be more prepared for your day, ready for what's going on, and uh, basically have more of your brain about you. And then uh, downregulate in, in the evening when you're going to sleep, doing some delta training. And <clears throat> for those that don't or haven't heard the news, uh, they now know that this part of the body called the glial lymphomic system, which is like our lymphatic system for the body, it only activates during deep level four sleep. So the only time you detox your brain. So if you're out there and you're getting headaches during the day, you're getting foggy brain, uh, you're not you're not really able to remember things correctly. It probably has a lot to do with your brain not detoxing. So mm -hmm. that's why deep sleep is so important. So uh, you know, two thirds of the world isn't sleeping. So I, I'm sure that's not any different over in India. <clears throat> absolutely. That's absolutely true. And I'm sure our listeners can resonate with this. And these are once again, some great actionables uh, to begin with. And when it comes to meditation, I mean, we've been doing it for years. We've been listening about it for years. And especially in India, I mean, it's it, it's like uh, every other person would, uh, you know, sort of practice meditation and yoga somewhere or the other in their life, right? But uh, it's very confusing when it comes to a topic of meditation. Like we know it helps us calm our nervous system down. We know that it's a good way to de-stress or even to take a few minutes out of our daily busy schedule just for ourselves, right? But what is the current research telling us about what exactly it does in our biology when we are meditating and 
who do you think is sort of you know practicing uh brain fitness at their best like would you say it's the yogis or the athletes like who are the people who are really you know sort of at the peak of uh practicing these things and whom can we sort of role model when it comes to this Actually, a lot of people aren't doing it correctly, even yogis. When we were in India, we measured some brains of yogis, and they weren't getting the regulation that they needed. So just because somebody's sitting with their eyes closed and they're breathing doesn't mean they're doing it right. Uh, what should be happening when you're when you're down-regulating the nervous system is we move from this state. Where we're talking right now is a beta state. This beta brainwave uh, causes a lot of cortisol and is tied to the addictive uh, neurotransmitter called dopamine. You know, most people are on this dopamine chase with the brain. So what we find is that it just takes practice. Uh, and with brain tap, you don't need a lot of practice. You just put it on mm -hmm. and it works for you. But in regular meditation, what should be happening is we we uh, remove the beta brain wave or we lessen it. And that can be done just by closing your eyes. Now, what we find is if you're not using light stimulus, like a candle or brain tap or something like that, your brain actually shuts down about 30% of the brain when you meditate. So that's why the yogis would do breath work because they need to get energy into the brain to do the work. And a lot of people think a meditation is like sleeping. They fall asleep or they become unconscious. In meditation, we should have a hyper awareness, a super awareness, but with a calm, relaxed body. You know, the uh, I'm not saying they're going to go into samadhi or something like that, but they can, they can, when you roll your eyes upward to start meditating, like we see the saints do this, mm -hmm. we now know in neuroscience that triggers the alpha response. So there's a physiological trigger that, of course, the gurus knew in the, in the rishis and things like that's talked about. And so when you, when you do this and you, then you start your breathing, what I recommend is most people don't know how to breathe when they meditate. There's a lot of breathing practices. So we have, we have over 70 sessions on brain tap to teach you how to breathe and meditate. But one of the simplest ways to do that is to, to choose a mantra. I, I do the TM mantra from the Maharishi and I have my own mantra. So, but if you don't have your own mantra, then just pick out two very powerful positive words. It could be gratitude and love and you breathe in gratitude, you breathe out love and you just visualize it coming out through your heart center. We, we were with Daji uh, there in uh, Hyderabad at one of his big events and we actually researched the heartfelt meditation. And my, uh, my researcher and I, and then we had Bravik Sharma, who's the head of physiology of all AIMS India. We, we gave and presented our findings to them. And what we found out, by the way, was the people who were projecting the loving energy to the other person, we're actually getting a better physiological response than the person receiving. So oh, wow. that it goes back to, it's better to give than receive, right? So, so when you're, even if there's no one to project it to, you can project it to your family, the loving energy, the healing, and then it will help the world. We do know that there's something they do call them the Maharishi effect now, because they mm -hmm. did a study here in New York City where they had TM practitioners actually all meditate together. And as they were doing their mantra, they were visualizing peace in the city of New York. And while they were meditating, they actually found a reduction in crime. And when they stopped meditating, they found the crime went right back. So that means that we have more control, each one of us. So that's why my mission to better a billion brains and why we're going, we're actually getting ready to launch into India because you have a billion brains there. You have more than a billion brains. So imagine a billion or, or more Indians and around the world, people meditating for world peace, for harmony, for tranquility. We're going to change our politicians. We're going to change the structure of the way things work because people will understand we live in a world of cooperation and collaboration, not a world of greed and, and uh, you know, who, whoever dies with the most toys wins. The reality is whoever dies with the most peace in, in their heart wins, you know, because that's the only thing we're going to take with us. We're not going to take all these toys. True. Wow, that just gave me goosebumps when you just spoke about the New York study. That's amazing, the kind of impact it can have. And <laughs> we are sort of like, we don't know the depth of it yet that well, right? So it's great to have speakers and leaders like you. And it's amazing to see your work in India and how sort of rooted it is also in like a, a yogi culture and their studies. I mean, that's something very interesting. I've not seen that before. So uh, I'm sure a lot of our Indian listeners will be receptive to this when they are listening to all these references and all these studies 
studies being done in India as well. So that's really amazing to know. And uh, when it comes to brain fitness, does it sort of differ how we can, uh, you know, approach it at different ages? I mean, if we are in our 20s or our 30s, what are some things we can start doing that would, you know, prevent cognitive decline in some sort of a way? And what if a person is in their 50s or 60s and they've just started becoming aware of this? Is, this, is there something like different that they'd be doing than a 20 or a 30 year old? Yeah, well, there's no time like now to start working on your brain fitness because uh, they've proven that the earlier in your in your life that you start using it, the better. You know, when when we we use a piece of technology called NeuroCheck, and that's what they use at the Ames Institute that we gave them to use for research, and we can actually um, put people together into their biological ages, and we know once they start using brain fitness meditation techniques that their biological age goes down and they become more youthful. And we've done studies, one study we did here in Florida in the United States, we took everyone during the study who had dementia and they were all taken off the dementia scale in six weeks because they had 39% more neuroplasticity. This means energy in the brain. So the more energy we have in our brain, then the better we can think, uh, perform and sleep, all the things that we need to do during the day, everything will be better. And plus, there's a part of our brain called the amygdala that always gets hijacked, you know, during times of fear. Fear is the biggest uh, block to human evolution because as long as you're fearful, as long as you're stressed, as long as you're worrying about things, you can't evolve as your true self. You know, you have a true spiritual nature. It's, it's like a seed and it's just waiting to be germinated. And when that seed is germinated through breath work, positive visualization, relaxation techniques, light, sound, and vibration. And by the way, light, sound, and vibration is talked about in the Rishis, in, in the Vedas, all throughout it. I mean, they called it chronos therapy, but it's the, um, and they talked about vibration and ohm. You know, all these things resonate through the body, and we know they change the structure of our physiology. They actually upregulate our epigenetics, which is now a new science. And we now know that there's another system of the body that is called the the biophotaic system or the light system. We are now, you know, the saints for years have said we are light. And now science is proving that, that we are light beings. Every time a cell divides, it emits uh, 650 nanometer light. And every person on earth is receiving and transmitting light. That's why when you're with some people, you feel energized. And mm -hmm. when you're with other people, you feel drained. And, you know, we need to work with the drainers, but we need to hang out with the gainers. You know, the, we, we need to make sure that we're flying together with those people who have strong, powerful energy. Here in uh, the United States even, our National Institute of Health now says that we have a biosphere. Now in India, we call it an aura. You know, yeah. now science is proving that we have this energy field around us. And we know that as you slow down your thinking, getting more into that alpha theta brainwave, that you energizing cleanse this energy field around you, it, it actually can be measured. It's, it's something that, like our heart rate, for instance, we can measure that from 18 feet away. Science is becoming more and more spiritual and spirituality is being validated by science. So, I mean, it, it's a time that, that I think is incredible. When I started this, and my dad was a meditation teacher and a thing called the Silva Method, we, we would measure it through GSR or galvanic skin response systems, which are very primitive to what we have today. But now we can actually tell people, hey, here's where your brain state is at, and here's where it's at after meditating. The purpose of meditation is, is twofold, right? It, you couldn't be for a spiritual practice and getting in touch with your divine self, but it's also going to have the side benefits of health and vitality, longevity, the capacity to think, sleep, and per perform, perform better at whatever you're doing. True, absolutely. That makes so much sense. And these are some great insights once again. And uh, talking about nutrition a little bit, of course, we don't have to go too much in detail of it. But uh, if you can shed some light on that, that what is it that we should sort of uh, some do's and don'ts in terms of nutrition uh, and also some supplements? Like, are there any sort of supplements that you yeah. also like to, you know, uh, use in your practice or that you recommend would be you know, good for our yeah. brain health yes. and the yeah. product? There, are, Yeah, there's a lot of different supplements that you can take, but number one, I would put niacin on the list, B3. 
It's probably the most underprescribed nutrient. It's very inexpensive. And what it does is it opens up the capillaries and you could have a flushing effect, but when you take it right before meditation, you're gonna get more blood flow and circulation to the brain. And that's what we need. It's a very simple, you can, you can buy it in pill form or you can uh, just buy it and mix it into water. You can buy it on Amazon, you know, India. I'm sure you can get it there. The, the other is that we just need a, a, a very good, um, you know, very good supplementation to feed the brain. And we need to get the brain to stop being a sugar burner. Um, mm -hmm. Stress causes, uh, there's an article that I wrote online called how stress is more fattening than chocolate. Because the uh, stress, your liver holds 25 grams of sugar. And every time you have a stressful event, it dumps it into the bloodstream. Now, as soon as it does that, that's that's like eating a candy bar. So, but you didn't get to enjoy it. You know, you, you, you've eaten this dessert, but it's basically just destroying your body because your brain is a fat burner, not a sugar burner. And your body works better on ketones or fat. So I think the biggest thing you can do in nutrients is make sure you have omega-3s, uh, really good omega-3s, you know, and the best way to get those, by the way, is in greens. So like when you think of algae, spirulina, uh, okay. also for those that are vegetarians that are listening to me, if you get, a, in America, we have a product called Energy Bits that you can look up online and find something comparable in, in India. But 10 of these tablets is like eating a steak. So protein wise, a lot of vegetarians aren't getting the protein that they need because they're, they're not eating meat, but we don't, we need the protein because protein is what our body runs on amino acids. So the greens in the form of spirulina or blue green algae, these are super for the brain. I mean, if you could even eat them with every meal, you would see a significant change in your cognitive function. It's really the foods, when you think about fish oil and people doing fish oil, the fish get it from the algae. So if you're vegetarian and you haven't taken the fish oils, just go directly to the source. Start getting the uh, spirulina, the blue and green algae. It's powerful. And um, look for the source, too. There's a lot of great sources. I know that Energy Bits is the one that we use here. I don't know if it's available. There. It might be available through Amazon, though. So right. you might want to look at that. That's one I take every day. In fact, I... I have one in my pocket because I carry them with me. If I get hungry, right here, ah, I just carry it with me everywhere I go. This is equivalent to two meals, but I usually eat this. This is this every ten tablets is like a steak, but I eat I eat thirty of them at a time because I'm a little overachiever. But the <laughs> but the uh, you know, and I'm bigger. You know, I'm I'm over two hundred pounds, so I want to make sure I get the uh, supplementation. And I know how good it is for the brain, but I don't want to go have a candy bar. I want to, mm -hmm. I want to eat something really healthy and vibrant for my brain and my body. And you'll see a significant difference when you do that. Also, if you can eat uh, blueberries, walnuts, you know, uh, nuts and seeds that are healthy. Um, most people will tell you to stay away from cashews, but um, those are, we really need to look for more of a fat diet that's healthy fats, not to, not potato chips and things like that, but healthy fats that, uh, and then your body will give you, convert those to energy. Now, if you're not used to eating a lot of those, and unfortunately, a lot of the, uh, like Indian sweets, because I've been over there, those are not good. <laughs> you know, if you do eat those, you need to make sure you eat them with, uh, with the greens, or I would say protein, uh, maybe some kind of protein drink, because you got to slow down that sugar. There's a reason that all the diabetes is happening in India. It's because of the diet. And it's not, I think it's a good diet. I mean, when you want to be vegetarian, but you've got to add in to make sure you're getting adequate fat, fiber, and protein. Right. <clears throat> That's amazing. I mean, uh, especially about fish oil and omega-3, because when it comes to omega-3, the number one thing that everybody talks about is uh, fish oil supplements or just like fish right and that's something new that i'm also hearing for the first time that vegetarian sources can be that powerful so that's a great news for our vegetarian listeners and also just everybody in general um and what would you say uh, how how effective is fasting as a method to you know approach and uh bring it's, health in any sort of way yes yeah fasting is super i mean you'll see many times we even have an on our app mindy pell's who's like the one of the world experts at this on our on our app 
because fasting creates autophagy, which means it's going to clean up those dead cells and zombie cells that are in the system. They can't be cleaned up any other way. Myself, I only eat two meals a day, and I got that from India, actually. In India, in the Vedas, they say eat three times a day, be sick, eat two times a day, be well, eat one time a day, be excellent. Uh, I'm not quite to the one time a day to be excellent because I eat a light meal for my second meal, usually uh, some kind of uh, protein and uh, and mine usually comes in the form of a whey protein or a bar that I found that doesn't have any sugar. And I do that with my greens. That's that's one meal a day typically, or I do a protein drink. And then I'll have one meal with the family. Uh, and then that seems to not only regulate my weight, but get me get my cognitive skills tweaked. If you eat all the time and your body is constantly digesting, and especially if you interrupt digestion, meaning that you eat, then you eat again, I have never seen that five times a day eating works unless you have a sugar problem with regulation in your body. Some people have to do that, but in general, you know, 90% of the people should be eating, uh, doing some kind of intermittent fasting, maybe even uh, once a month doing a 24 hour water fast. You know, th there's a lot of good books about it. I'm not an expert at fasting. I do it myself every day. I do intermittent fasting and then I do uh, longer term fasting because it, it's just, we have to clean out the system. We we overeat, uh, especially here in the United States, uh, so much that, you know, I'm not going to starve. If I get that hungry, I'll go eat something. True. And I mean, it's one of the cheapest thing available to us to do right now. You know, like if our listeners could just go out, research for themselves and find experts and their books on it. It'll, it's like one of the easiest, cheapest thing available to us right now. So that's a good news. Uh, and talking about brain fog, you know, because that's, uh, unfortunately, it's being normalized so badly. Like we just use it so lightly, you know, oh, I have brain fog. Uh, or even while fasting, in fact, this is one of the biggest thing that uh, people say, it's sort of a myth that, you know, oh, I'm fasting, I'm having a lot of brain fog in the morning. You know, like I have to wait for my uh, first meal, I have to break my fast and all that. So when it comes to brain fog, what do you think uh, are some of the things that we, sh we can start doing and, you know, that it's not normal to have brain fog this often? Right. Right. I think that the main thing people are doing is they're not getting enough sleep, first of all. Think of sleep as your time to incubate your superpowers for the day. If you're not if you're not sleeping, then they've actually shown in studies if you get poor sleep three days in a row, it's as if you were drinking and your mm. body functions in the same way. So there's a lot of people out there that are functioning that way and think it's normal. Brain fog is not normal. And what it really means is the brain isn't regulating. So uh, and then so I think Starting a good sleep routine, finding a way to measure it, one hour of deep sleep to at least two hours of REM sleep. Length of time in bed is not the solution. It's efficient sleep that's the solution. You uh, Studies show that six and a half hours to seven hours is optimal. So somebody laying in bed for 12 hours doesn't give them any more sleep. You know, in fact, that might even hurt them. Um, and then we have to move and breathe. Uh, there's been a study done just recently that shows if you're sitting, I'm standing right now while we're talking, if we're, if you're sitting for more than three hours, mm -hmm. you've now, uh, lost 10% of the oxygen in your brain. So there's a, there's a saying over here that sitting is the new smoking, but it's actually worse than smoking because we have to get up and move and breathe. So if you have a job where you have to sit on your butt all day, then set some timers and, Every hour, get up and do some stretching, some exercising, some breath work, but get up because your nervous system is designed. We're designed, actually, when the sun's out, we should be out hunting and gathering or, you know, doing the things that we need to do as humans instead of, you know, sitting in a chair, uh, walk, looking at our cell phones, stressing out. So, and I think the other thing that people need to do is set their phones so they do not beep at them every time the average person in America looks at their phone 300 times a day. So every time you do that, you get a cortical response in the brain, in the limbic brain, which hijacks the amygdala, which means that you have a stress response. So it means that you're eating a little bit of a candy bar 300 times a day. Now the body cannot regulate then. You're going to gain weight. You're going to dysregulate the brain. You're going to have foggy brain. You're in because you're not a sugar burner. You're, you're a fat burner uh, in the form of ketones. So that's something too. And then if you if you really want to start getting rid of it uh, after you eat your meals, then go for a short walk. 
because yeah. that's going to that's going to teach the body to regulate and upregulate the nervous system because when we eat we actually stimulate our metabolism but if we're just sitting there it will downregulate and so but if we go for just a short walk i mean that's great if you can exercise in the morning <clears throat> building muscle the muscle gives you the forgiveness of eating a poor diet you know if, so you've got to build the muscle you know you in a lot of people say they want the six pack abs. You probably heard that before. They want to look like the bodybuilders. Well, those abs are built in the kitchen, not in the gym. So Ooh. if you can't you can't really work out and make your body look good by eating garbage. So a lot of times people will work out, get those those brain chemicals going because when you work out, especially with heavy weights, and minimize you don't need as much cardio as you might think. You need more building of muscle. So if you can build the muscle, that's going to be great for the brain, and it's going to it's going to take care of a lot of that extra sugar that's circulating through the system. Wow, yeah. amazing! These were some great insights. I hope that our listeners are taking notes right now because there's just so much to learn from this one episode. Uh, and my last question for you is that you know uh, you've given us a big list of all of these actionables, but what would you say are your top five absolute do's when it comes to green health? And let's leave nutrition out of this because that's a whole big concept. But what would you say are five right. big actionables <clears throat> that would want our listeners to start from today itself? The number one is start your day with a mindful practice. Because if you win your morning, you're going to win the day. Uh, number two, do some kind of intermittent fasting. Some people can fast in the morning, some people fast in the evening, but give your, give your body 12 to 16 hours without any solid food. You can drink water and even eat greens during that time, but you can't, anything else, put off. That's number two. Number three, you've got to start some kind of physical practice, whether it be Tai Chi, yoga, or dance. Do something to get your body moving and breathing. These are non-negotiables. Number four, <clears throat> then, Take a break in the middle of the day. We've actually proven with the top performers at Google and at Microsoft that if they took 20 minutes out of their day and did a, this brain-based meditation at BrainTap, that they improved their work performance. But the number one thing is their depression scores went up 70%. They were chronically depressed. And these were the top 1% of performers. They didn't know they were depressed because they were so busy being busy. <laughs> number five, pick a time and sleep. The two mm -hmm. every hour before 12 o'clock is worth two hours after 12 o'clock which in building melatonin melatonin is not just needed for sleep it's needed in every cell to produce health because every cell of your body acts like a little mini brain and it has its own intelligence it has a chromoform it's going to absorb energy and store that energy for the next day if you don't get the sleep that you need pretty much all the rest of what i'm talking about doesn't matter because your body your body needs that deep cycle sleep to reset your circadian rhythm, but also to build up your neurotransmitter bank account so you can make those decisions in the next day with, with integrity and with energy and vitality, looking at a healthy, uh, very productive future. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing this with us. And as we conclude with this episode, do you have any last messages to leave us with? Number one, I want everyone to realize that you are not what you've been told. You're far greater than you've been led to believe. Regardless of what your brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, preachers, and teachers have told you, you are an infinite being, and you can overcome whatever is before you. You have the capacity within you. So don't pray for your stress to be gone. Let's work at building our resilience and building up our capacity to handle the stress because we need we need you. The world needs you to be in the most positive, optimistic state so that we can get those one billion better brains that I think are going to transform the world like the Maharishi said. I think that we're all on a mission to do that. We all do it in different ways, but I think if we can get everybody realizing the truth that we are divine beings having this physical experience and we're here not alone, but together to transform this planet. Absolutely. That's a very powerful message. And I'm having goosebumps as you say that. So thank you so much for sharing this and for being here today, giving us your time and amazing insights for our audience. We're really grateful to have you here today. Well, thank you for having me. I look forward to seeing you when I go on my next trip to India. It'd be fun. Absolutely. We'd love to host you in India once again. Uh, that's it for today's episode. I am Sakshi Pawar and I'll be your host for the Settle or Be Better podcast. So stay tuned while we bring more inspiring stories away. You know the drill. Subscribe to the Settle 
or be better podcast like share and comment on our videos and do hit the bell icon because you don't want to miss the mind boggling health discussions we are about to bring for you why settle when you can be better